Good morning, and thank you for coming. Today I'll be talking about detecting and denying DNA evidence, a history of forensic identification. So let's start with an historical figure. This is first president, George Washington. And if we look at forensic features, we can see that President Washington has a nose. Okay, so we could identify that anyone who would have a nose must be the person who is the same as this individual we're looking at, because that's a forensic feature. In fact, we can say, is there a match? Is it the same person? Here are two presidents, I have that in common. They both have a nose. They share a feature in common. That's a match. Are they the same person? Or maybe it's a coincidence. And so the purpose of DNA match statistics, which you read about in the paper and you hear all the time, and without which DNA evidence doesn't come into court in most jurisdictions, is to provide information. It's a balance of probabilities. On the one hand, we can see that there may be a match. And on the other scale, we could see that there could be a coincidence. And a match statistic weighs those probabilities. It was first developed in its modern form by Alan Turing as part of his Enigma project during World War II as a way of objectively balancing probabilities. And we'll be hearing more about match statistics. It's a measure of information, of identification information. DNA biology, as we know it today, was pretty much started in the 1950s with Watson and Crick. The concept, as you see on the left, is that the human body is made up of trillions of cells. Most of them have a nucleus. And inside that nucleus is the human genome. There are two copies of the human genome, one inherited from a person's mother, one from their father. Each copy has three billion letters in it, and those three billion letters, that text, is subdivided into 23 chromosomes. Since there's two copies, there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. And as shown on the right, if you unravel a chromosome and look at it at the molecular level, what you see is text. It's written in a genetic alphabet with the letters A, C, G, and T. These are different nucleotides or chemical bases, and it's just text that scientists or nature can read. An interesting concept from this text that was discovered during the Human Genome Project is the short tandem repeat. So the short tandem repeats were discovered in the 1980s. These are stretches of DNA, paragraphs of text, that are completely fixed except for a variable region in the center based on the number of occurrences of a word. The reason they're called short tandem repeats is there's a short word, in forensics usually four letters, in the DNA alphabet, and that word is repeated in tandem. If we take a look on the right, we see the word root repeated 10 times. Root, 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 root. On the left, we have our genetic encyclopedia. There are 23 volumes, each corresponding to a chromosome. There are about 100,000 paragraphs like this scattered throughout our genome. Some have one-letter words, some have 10-letter words, but what they have in common is the beginning is the same. Here we see, in English, a paragraph that says, take me out to the ball game. And it continues with fixed text, and then there's the word root, 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 which may go on five times or eight times, 10 times, 20 times, typically, there's about 15 different variants or alleles, the number of times this word is repeated. And then the text continues. For the home team, if they don't win, it's a shame. And then it ends at the old ball game. Why this is a good source of variation is because by measuring the length of this paragraph, scientists can work out how many times that word root is repeated. It's a very simple measurement before DNA sequencing was inexpensive. It was first published in 1989. And the concept is, well, if you want to measure variation in the population, we need to find differences. And here, there are about 15 different differences, depending on the length of the word. And scientists only have to count up the number of letters in a DNA sequence, which is 
much easier and can be less expensive than working out the entire sequence. So what we'll see is that these variants or alleles that are used to distinguish between each other correspond to the lengths. Whatever the length of that paragraph is, it has 10 repeats of a word. The allele, the variant is 10. If the paragraph were measured to be four letters longer, we'd know there are 11 repeats of a four letter word. So by knowing the length, we know the variant, we know the allele. And that's been the basis of forensic genotyping now for 20 years. What a genotype is, is a pair of these alleles. So at one of these locations on a chromosome, you have two copies, one that's inherited from your mother and one from your father, and there are different lengths of the repeated word. Here we're seeing on the left a particular region on a chromosome, a locus, and the mother allele has 10 repeats of this four-letter word, the father allele has 12 repeats, and so that pair of alleles is a 10-12. And the task of modern forensic DNA is to work out what the genotypes are and make comparisons. Genotypes, because they're in pairs, give about 100 variants, not just 15. That's because 15 times 15 over 2 is around 100. And so each location now gives 100 possibilities, which can better distinguish between people and identify. And scientists look at 10 to 20 of these locations on different chromosomes that are independent. If you consider the possibilities, 100 from one location, 100 genotype possibilities at a second location, times yet another 100 possibilities, you have 100 times 100 times 100, 10 or 20 times. That's why you end up with a trillion, trillion possible genotypes, a lot more genetic barcodes than there are people. The other reason why genotypes are important is because Every cell has two doses at this location, and we'll see that in interpreting evidence, having equal doses is important. So the simple type of DNA interpretation that was done 20 years ago, earlier on in Professor Lee's career, was DNA taken from a single person. It could be a huge pool of blood on the floor, like in the OJ case, or from a cheek swab. Lots of DNA from one person. That's indicated on the left. Then what the laboratory does, shown by the arrow on the left, is the laboratory extracts DNA from the sample. They amplify the DNA from these short tandem repeat regions, making millions of labeled copies that have fluorescent tags on them. Then the third step is to separate and detect these fluorescent fragments, because the alleles have different sizes. There are DNA sequencers, also called genetic analyzers, that can separate out DNA by size. And that tells us what the alleles are. If you look at the center, here's a cartoon of what that evidence data would look like. Of all the possible alleles there might be, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on, from one person with a lot of DNA, a person can only have one or two alleles. That's all they've inherited from their parents. It can be the same or different. Here are two peaks. There's the 10 from one parent, the 12 from the other parent. We don't see signal at the other locations. And so just by looking at the two tallest peaks over 20 years ago, scientists could look at data like this and infer that the evidence genotype was a 10-12. So, Whatever the genotype was that we couldn't see in the evidence item, molecular biology would reveal it in the data at this is one of, say, 15 locations, and there'd be two peaks, a 10 and a 12, nothing else. There's the genotype, and later on, comparisons can be made and match statistics calculated. How do we know what are the two tallest peaks? Well, there's a method that's been used for years, and as you came into Pittsburgh, or if you live here, you saw a beautiful skyline, perhaps in silhouette, with lots of tall buildings, short buildings, middle buildings, and so on. The approach that scientists have taken in crime labs is to draw a line through those buildings, drawing a threshold. And any building or allele peak that was over the threshold would be considered to be an allele. 
any that was under would be considered to be not an allele. So applying these thresholds to the Pittsburgh skyline, we end up with either buildings of the same height or vacant lots. So we're losing a lot of information, but with one person's DNA, that works fine because there'd only be one or two buildings and we could distinguish the one or two tall buildings from all the other buildings. However, starting around 15 years ago, forensic scientists realized that most DNA evidence is not from one person. It's a mixture of two, three, four, five, six or more people. For example, a handgun may have DNA from the four or five people who touched it. A sexual assault may have the victim, an assailant, a consensual partner or more people. Most DNA is a mixture. And the problem now is just by looking at the tallest peaks, that may not be as effective as it was with single source DNA. So over 15 years ago, the federal government instituted some procedures that were very simple to follow. It basically said, draw a threshold through your data. Each lab can determine its own threshold, that red line you see. Determine what the tall peaks are. Consider them to be the alleles, the DNA of those genetic variants. And now you can calculate a match statistic because you can't go to court without a match statistic. What do you do? Each allele has a different frequency of occurrence, maybe 10% or 5% or 15% in the population. Add up the allele frequencies, square that number, take one over the number, and now you have your probability of inclusion. If you have multiple tests, multiply those numbers together, and that was called the combined probability of inclusion, and it's the most used match statistic in forensic science for mixers. It's been done millions of times. That's CPI. There have been questions as to how well forensic science works. In 2009, the National Academy of Sciences issued a report called Strengthening Forensic Science, where they were unhappy with most of forensic science. They didn't say anything bad about DNA, but then they didn't say much about mixtures. All they said was there could be difficulties of interpretation with mixtures. So I'm going to focus now on DNA mixtures, which is the main type of DNA evidence that's found in crime labs, and ask where is the science in that forensic science. There were concerns with mixtures that maybe just drawing a line through quantitative data and reducing it to a list of in or out might not be the best approach. So an early study that was done by the federal government and the Department of Commerce in the old Bureau of Standards, it's now called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, was to send out the same DNA data to about 70 laboratories and ask them to interpret this two-person mixture, fairly straightforward two-person mixture. Most of the laboratories said it was inconclusive and they couldn't interpret it. That's been borne out by many studies since then that most mixtures are called inconclusive by crime labs and are never used as evidence by police, prosecutors, or defenders. But the minority of labs that did report a statistic did not find the same number as their information, their weight of evidence. Instead, their numbers ranged from tens of thousands to hundreds of trillions of the same data. And that was the first indication from a federal study that maybe if you say that there's no information or when you give information, it ranges from four zeros after the one to 14 zeros after the one, maybe there's an issue. Another concern, which some workers began publishing about five to 10 years ago, was bias. The methods like probability of inclusion are inclusionary methods. They can only include, they can't exclude. So how does one use this procedure. What most crime labs do is first they have an expert, forensic analyst, choose the data. They choose which peaks to use. The thresholds can be of some guidance. They choose which locations to use. If there are 15 different tests, they may choose only eight of them. Because after they choose their data, the second step is that a human analyst decides whether or not 
the defendant or another person is present in the mixture. So first, a subjective human decision is made as to whether or not an individual is there. And that's their interpretation. Only after the data have been chosen by a person, a human decision is made, is a statistic calculated on the chosen data to put a number to the foregone conclusion that the defendant is guilty or present in the evidence. And the result of this is a biased DNA workflow. And various studies have been able to replicate that bias and show how wrong answers occur. The problem is that people are put in the process because the software methods and technology are fairly limited, and that introduces human bias. This was proven once again in a 2013 study, again done by NIST, the federal government, where they sent out five different mixtures to laboratories. This is 100 laboratories who responded. This was a three-person mixture in which the sample to be compared against the mock defendant actually wasn't present in the mixture. 70% of crime labs said he was in the mixture, falsely, and gave a match statistic ranging from around 10 to hundreds of thousands. Only six of the 100 respondents said, no, the guy isn't there and gave the correct answer. And of course, we had the usual 25 or so inconclusives. So this is a problem when crime labs are reporting results using methods like CPI inclusion probabilities, and they can give no information, falsely include the wrong people, and even if somebody's there, the information they're reporting on is the wrong number. The result was that by around two years ago, these mixture statistics were starting to shut down crime labs. In the District of Columbia, crime labs shut down for a while because the method of CPI was not being followed the way the FBI liked. In Texas, labs have been opening and closing as the state realized that there were issues, particularly as new protocols came on board and the country went from one threshold to two threshold methods which forced a re-review of older data and the two threshold method gave totally different answers than the one threshold method much of the time. So in Texas, there's been a review of 25,000 samples of mixtures. Scientists have taken a closer look at this. This is a study that I published a year and a half ago which basically says there's no scientific basis for this CPI method. There are theoretical reasons that people had given before, but this was a study done on actual data from a crime lab looking at over 500 locus tests where we determined several things. One is that the data were the right half of a distribution. It could only include, not exclude. And the average information value was zero. So it looked like random sampling from the tail of a distribution that didn't mean very much. And then it turned out that there was essentially no correlation between actual identification information and the reported CPI statistic. In fact, what it ended up being is that when a scientist in a crime lab chooses to report, say, 12 of 15 loci, for every two locations, there's another factor of 10. So if you report on two locations, the number will be around 10. If you report on four locations, it'll be around 100. Usually scientists are reporting on 12 or 13 locations, so the numbers were always around a million. If you look through old forensic reports from five or 10 years ago, the match statistic is always around a million. And the reason is, is the CPI methods and random number generator, and by the law of large numbers, if you do 10, tests, you'll get five zeros. You do 12 tests, you'll get six zeros. You're just randomly counting up the tests. You're not actually extracting the identification information. So the problem with these human mixture interpretation methods are many. Here's some of the problems. First, they're inaccurate. The statistic that you get doesn't agree with the true identification information. The methods are subjective because the workflow of how the methods are used introduces human bias in many places. These methods are widespread. They've been used in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of cases. So there's a past that is problematic. 
The methods are opaque because there's human choices that are using only some of the data, and we don't really know how those choices are made in any objective way. And the methods are biased in multiple ways. You look at the answer as part of the process, but also you can only include somebody who you've decided is there or give no answer. You can't exclude. And most of the time, the answer is inconclusive, which means no report is written at all. So there are ways of looking at data that don't begin with thresholds, but start by using all of the data. And there's a family of computer technologies that have been developed, of which Trulio is one. We started on this in 1999, that have been more thoroughly tested and vetted than the subjective failed methods. A method like Trulio is accurate. There have been 34 validation studies, seven of them published in a peer-reviewed journal. There have been no studies on the older methods, except as a straw man when they don't work in a more modern study. The methods are objective and that the workflow can remove human bias. You put data into a computer, an answer comes out. Certainly, Trulio has been accepted by courts. We've reported results in 37 states. There have been admissibility hearings in 12 courts over 10 states that I've testified in, all successful to date. This method's in use by seven labs. Other laboratories use other software. These methods are transparent. You're not dealing with a black box of the human mind. We can provide the math. In fact, in any case, we give the opposition the software to test for free so they can do their own studies and retest evidence. That's harder to do with a crime lab analyst. You can't sort of give them to the defense for free for a week. I guess you could. And the methods are neutral in that they don't just include, they include or exclude by measuring information. If you get a match statistic like a million, that's an indication that a match between the evidence and the defendant is a million times more probable than coincidence, that's inclusionary. But if the number is one in a million, that means that a coincidence is a million times more probable and the balance on the weight of evidence changes. So this is about modern information, not about human choices. DNA mixture interpretation looks like this when you separate genotypes. Here on the left, we have a mixture. Two or more people have contributed their DNA to a sample. The crime lab does exactly what it did before. It extracts DNA, it amplifies it, and then it detects and separates the DNA in order to form the kind of evidence data that we see in the center. Here we see three events, not just two, and since people generally only have two alleles, because we only have two parents, getting one allele from each, this indicates that there's at least one other person present. And then what a computer can do is to separate out the genetic types, what the allele pairs are, from the data. So at each location that's tested, say of the 15 locations, the computer can identify the genetic types or genotypes of each of the contributors. Suppose we know the first contributor was a 1012, then the second contributor's genotype is shown on the top right. We have to account for that new 11 allele that we didn't see before in the center of the slide. And so we have to consider possibilities that account for the 11. But we don't see an 8 or a 9 or a 13 or a 14. So the three main possibilities would be whatever contains an 11 and a 10, 11, or a 12. And there they're listed, a 10, 11, an 11, 11, and 11, 12. That's the genotype of the second contributor at this one tested location. And the only change conceptually, which is quite reasonable in the 21st century, is that if the data don't give you one unique answer of the, say, 100 possible allele pairs, it's giving you a list of possibilities with probability. And so the way uncertainty is addressed in modern science is with probability. And the math doesn't care, and actually juries are fine with this as well. Ultimately, when you make a comparison, as shown on the bottom right, if that known genotype were in 1112 from a defendant or another individual at that location, we see the 1112 has 50% probability. That means the match statistic is halved. Instead of getting 100% of the match statistic, you only get half of it. 
Let me tell you about a few cases where rigorous interpretation of DNA mixture information made a difference. This was the first case where a computer like this was ever used. It was in southwestern Pennsylvania. It involved state trooper Kevin Foley, who the girlfriend he was living with had a husband, Dr. John Yelenick, and Dr. John Yelenick was found dead on his floor, having exsanguinated from multiple slashing wounds out in Blairsville in Indiana County. And Trooper Foley was the main suspect, and there was very little physical evidence, but there was some DNA under the dentist's fingernails. And that DNA had two components from the data that the FBI developed. One was a 93% component that corresponded to the victim, and the other was the 7% component of an unknown individual. By having the computer separate out that genetic type of the unknown 7% component, make a comparison with trooper Kevin Foley, the initial CPI match statistic, which had been 13,000, by using objective science and all the data, moved to 189 billion, which was more accurate and more objective. There was a admissibility hearing at the time, and we had done studies that showed that the amount of DNA pretty much predicted the range of the match statistic. And Kevin Foley was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. I've testified over 50 times, 12 of them here in, in Allegheny County for the prosecution, and last month I testified for the first time for the defense. This is the Josh Huber case. There was no question that Mr. Huber had shot and killed two of his guests in his apartment in the Pittsburgh area. But the question was, what did all of this mean? So here's a match table of the type that you see in reports and in cases. The second column gives a description of evidence items, blood on the living room wall. DNA under one victim's fingernails, DNA under another victim's fingernails. The columns, the three columns, correspond to people. The first two columns are victims, the deceased. The last column is the defendant, Joshua Huber. And what we see is that there's, in blue, those are inclusionary matches. There are big numbers in the quintillions, the type that a crime lab can detect from a mixture, that were known to associate the defendant with the living room wall blood and victims with their own fingernails. Most of the other numbers were not detected by the crime lab, but they give information. In fact, Joshua Huber's DNA is under both the victim's fingernails, which the defense used to indicate there was a struggle. The victim's DNA, as shown in red, are not on the living room blood stain on that mixture. Those numbers are more like one in 100 million. And so this is a fact pattern that was presented to the jury and the prosecution and the defense argued using the facts without attacking the science. The prosecution argued why this was first degree murder. The defense argued why this was self-defense. And this together with a 911 call with some of the main evidence in the trial and Mr. Huber was actually acquitted of first degree murder last month. This case, is a man, David Black, who was accused of murdering his wife. He was going through a divorce with her, Bonnie Black. And the questions here were, did Mr. Black actually enter into his old house, leave his baseball hat there by accident, perhaps, and touch certain light switches and not touch other light switches? And here in the first column for David Black, we see that he did leave his DNA on the hat and on the master bedroom switch, but not on the relatively unused bathroom light switch. This indicates where he was at the crime scene. A key question here in cases where husbands kill wives and there are children is the defense will often say that DNA from the mixture, using methods like CPI that can't make any distinction, they came from the children together with the wife. They didn't come from the husband. And as you see on the top right, these are some of the statistics we reported, we are able to exclude the children, Craig and Eleonora, with exclusionary match statistics and show, no, the DNA actually came from the husband, not from the children. And ultimately, I think last year, Mr. Black was convicted of murdering his wife. This is a case in 
Maryland that was interesting. Nelson Clifford was a serial rapist, but he had an interesting psychological ability to manipulate juries. So this was the fifth time he was on trial. He'd been acquitted the previous four times. And what Mr. Clifford was able to do was to watch the evidence being presented by the prosecution and by the various experts and the forensics experts, watch the jury, and then come up with an amazing story that was believable and tell it sincerely. The fifth time, he wasn't so lucky because there was a computer that could separate out the DNA evidence, say from this shirt, and identify and make comparisons and show that the victim and her consensual partner and Mr. Clifford were present. There was a belt that was used to tie up the victim, where again, DNA was present from different people. And by more thoroughly identifying and dissecting the DNA into the different contributors and showing that there was information, as opposed to not giving information, his story wasn't as compelling. And Mr. Clifford was ultimately convicted. He was actually just convicted of a third degree sexual offense, but given his prior convictions, he went to life in prison. The bottom line there is that crime labs don't use all the DNA data. Instead of having patterns like we see in data, where here at one location there's an allele at 15, 16, 17, and 18 from left to right, where there's different heights of low heights, tall heights, very low heights, miss, you know, missing alleles altogether. That's an informative pattern that can tell us how many people are present, to what extent, what the possible genotypes are. Instead, by just taking a scissor and cutting through the data with a threshold, data like this can be reduced to a statement like 15 and 16 are there and nothing else is there. And clearly that's less informative than looking at quantities. Right? Knowing that your bank balance exceeds $1,000 may theoretically put you in the same category as Bill Gates, but practically it doesn't. I want to talk a little bit about a local homicide case that happened three years ago. Two sisters from Iowa, from a prominent legal family, had moved to Pittsburgh. Sarah Wolf was a physician at Western Psych, and her sister Susan had joined her. She was working in Squirrel Hill, which is a local neighborhood at a school, and they were found shot in the back of their heads in their East Liberty home in Pittsburgh. There was no apparent motive. It was, really wasn't clear what had happened. As usual, the crime lab, like virtually all crime labs in the country, didn't use all the DNA data. Over the threshold, the peaks were considered allele events. There's a 15 and a 16. Under the threshold, the data disappeared. And this pattern of information that could be used to extract more information was present in the data, but not used in the interpretation. So when the crime lab first looked at this mass of DNA evidence in the case against Alan Wade, their thresholds failed to interpret most of the mixtures. There was a hat that had been left at a scene from which there were no conclusions. There was a cup that was found in the house. There was insufficient data. So for each of these items of evidence shown in blue on the left, this is what the crime lab report said. Contamination, insufficient data, insufficient data, cannot be excluded, insufficient data, too complex, no conclusions. Most mixtures in the US are reported as inconclusive. And this is what crime labs read like, depending on the reason why it's called inconclusive. But some of this evidence is important, like the DNA under the fingernails of a victim. That's important evidence to just call inconclusive if, in fact, there's information there. So what computers can do is they can use all the data. This is one of the 15 loci that were tested. It has a name, BWA. And here we see a pattern of peak heights. From left to right on the x-axis, we see the length of the DNA paragraph, the number of letters, 138, 143. The boxes at the top of the peaks show us the number of repeats, the alleles, 15, 16, 17, and 18. The height shows us the relative fluorescence units. How much signal did the genetic analyzer detect at this location from this genetic test? We see that there are different heights. The 15 is half the height of the 16. 
we see variation. Variation can be used by computers to calculate probabilities. And we see a pattern of lows and highs and missings. That's quantitative data. And this is how the computer thinks. Well, actually, the computer considers about 100 variables. But we're just going to look at, at this one location, the genotypes, the values of three contributors, and how well they explain the data. The goal of a modern computer, it's been called Bayesian computing. It means you start with the data. You don't change the data. Your task is to explain the data to try to explain this pattern. So here's one proposal. Suppose this one individual, shown with blue rectangles, whose allele pair is 16, 16, and a certain quantity corresponding to that height. That would account for the 16 peak seen in the data. And suppose there's a second contributor whose genotype is a 15, 17, shown in green. Again, the goal is to come up with many explanations knowing that explanations that better explain the data will have a higher likelihood. And suppose the third contributor shown in orange has a 1518 genotype. So we add all of the alleles together of the different amounts from the genotypes of each of the three contributors, and now we have an explanation for the peak pattern. A better explanation, like what we're seeing here, confers higher probability when separating out each of these three genotypes. Why is this a good pattern? If you look at the tops of the colored rectangles, you see that same medium, high, low, low pattern that's in the data. It's explaining the data quantitatively. The computer will also try out another 100,000 explanations, most of which are terrible and have very low probability. In the end, what the computer can do is to concentrate probability from 100 possibilities for a contributor at one location to maybe only 5 or 10 based on only the data, not based on what the answer is supposed to be, not by looking at a defendant. The genotypes become stand-ins for the data itself before a comparison is ever made. And this is what an evidence genotype looked like in this case. Of the 100 or so possibilities, we see a list of four possibilities. They're indicated on the bottom. A 1516, a 1616, a 1517, and a 1617. Those are the four possibilities where most of the probability went to for that first blue contributor. The height of the bars is their probability. Anything could be possible, and often is. This is just what the probabilities are. So this objective analysis of data determines genotypes just from the data. Now a comparison can be made. Those genotypes are locked down by the computer server. Those blue bars, they don't change. But now a comparison can be made to anyone, to you, to everybody in the room, to a million people on a database. You can always make a comparison. When you make a comparison, the weighing of evidence is comparing the chance of an actual match with the chance of coincidence. The chance of a match is shown in the blue bars. That's the probability of a match. The brown bars next to those blue bars are the chance of a coincidence. There's about 100 of those. I'm only showing these four. Those chances are worked out by crime labs, nationally and state by state. And the question is, if we compare what we know from the evidence match probability to the coincidence probability, what's the ratio? When the ratio is less than 1, as we see all the way on the left with that 16-16, we see that coincidence is twice as likely as an actual specific evidence match. And that would give you an exclusionary weight. That would give you a number of a half. The blue bar is half the height of the brown bar. On the other hand, if we go over 1 and look at the 16-16, we see that the blue bar is at 55%, whereas the coincidence is only 5%. And dividing the chance of a match by the chance of coincidence, 55 over 5 gives us 11. Now, that comparison can be made at any allele pair. In this case, it turned out that Mr. Wade's genotype happens to be a 1616 at the VWA locus. And so that ratio of 55 to 5 is 11, and that's the match statistic. 
What if we were doing old style DNA and there was only one person present in the evidence? Then that blue bar would have been 100%, and 100% divided by 5% would have been 20. So we see that by having uncertainty, the match statistic reduces from 20 to 11, but you don't need to throw out the data. You can have a computer analyze it. Doing this at all 15 locations, they're listed from top to bottom on the left vertical axis. And then looking at the match statistic shown on the x-axis on a scale of around 0 to 150, we see how much match information there is. Circled in red is the 11 that we just saw at BWA. Multiplying these numbers together from independent loci gives us the match statistic. And we can then say that a match between the fingernails and Mr. Wade is 6 trillion times more probable than coincidence, which is certainly better than saying nothing. And ultimately, the crime lab did report five DNA mixture matches. When they retested the fingernails after the contamination, they also got a strong match. The True Allele computer found 17 matches on the same data, and these are basically new matches, and showing the item in blue, the match statistic in green, ranging from hundreds to trillions, and then the people who were identified as the victim or defendant. Based on DNA and other evidence, Alan Wade was found guilty on all counts, and he's now serving a sentence of life in prison. But there's another part of the story that's interesting, which is moving toward more, how does DNA help us in society? So threshold methods fail to interpret DNA mixtures, and computers could do better on the same data. Interestingly, one of the evidence items was a hat. And this hat had been left from a burglary of the Wolf Sisters' home six weeks before they were killed. So if you think of DNA processes where it's not acceptable to call DNA inconclusive, it's not acceptable to wait six or 12 months for DNA to be analyzed, and there's some countries that can process their DNA evidence in a week. Imagine if we lived in a world where a hat found at a burglary was taken seriously in terms of interpreting evidence, a evidence was found, a match statistic was identified, a person was identified weeks before a murder happened, then crimes may not need to happen. If you've identified a burglar and arrested him beforehand, then he's probably not going to go ahead and kill some people who are his next door neighbors later on. So this is where DNA can help prevent crime. Typically with DNA, there's no information from any sort of complex mixture. This is a typical case where there's DNA from a handgun, the lab says there's four people here, no conclusions can be made, that's shown in red, and then it ends, unless you do a computer analysis. When the computer looks at the identical data, the DNA on that handgun can be separated into four genotypes, known up to probability, and then compared with people. This particular crime involved a car in Allegheny County and another car in Allegheny County with teenagers with guns shooting and a police officer who was watching this happening and there was just lots of action and a lot of confusion. But the DNA could help separate out what happened. And ultimately, there was another defendant who was excluded, so the case went from federal to county. And then, as shown in red, there was another person who was excluded statistically by the computer. Charges were dropped. And person B, in green, there was a match statistic of 400,000, and he pled guilty to the crime. So instead of going into an expensive, confusing trial, here we have forensic DNA evidence that can work out what actually happened. In Allegheny County, Cybergenetics has worked on 59 cases so far. There have been 13 trials. Four people have been cleared as well of crimes through DNA. And as you see in the outcome column, the fourth column down, most of the outcomes, when there is an outcome, is a guilty plea because the DNA 
which had been kept out of the case, is brought back in when there's a match statistic. So there's a concept of pursuing the past. Three years ago, we had looked at a project of reanalyzing all the DNA that we had in the county and going forward by having the computer analyze DNA while the crime lab learned how to report on it and got their own systems ready. This would have been a free project. There was interest on the part of the district attorney's office and others, but there was less interest in the crime lab and having somebody looking over their shoulder. But it is important to pursue the past, as this case teaches us. In 1989, there was a car with five men in it that was wandering around the highways. And they started bumping cars, and then when the driver got out to exchange insurance information, they would then rob the driver. They then escalated to beating the driver. Then they moved on to raping the driver, crime after crime, until at some point they were robbing, beating, and raping the victims. So these were pretty horrific crimes. They were known to be five men. And Daryl Pinkins and his two co-workers, Roosevelt Glenn and another individual, were misidentified. The people who were committing these crimes were also breaking into cars. They broke into their car, stole their uniforms from work. The uniforms were left at one of the crime scenes, and the police traced them down back to the factory where they worked through the uniforms. Because obviously, if you're going around beating, raping, and robbing people, you will leave your uniforms at a crime scene. DNA was only in its infancy back then, and they were wrongfully convicted. Daryl Pinkins received a 65-year sentence. Roosevelt then received a shorter sentence. I think 17 years he ended up serving. And here's the important part of the story. In 2001, there was DNA data that was generated through the Wrongful Conviction Clinic at Indiana Law School. And the DNA existed, but the old interpretation methods of the past could only identify a major contributor from the sweater, major contributor from the victim's jacket. And the post-conviction court said, well, you have two new people you've identified. We had three co-defendants. That equals the five individuals who we know were perpetrating the crimes. They can all stay in jail. And so Pinkins and Glenn stayed in jail. Fifteen years later, after Mr. Glenn had gotten out, Pinkins was still serving a sentence. I was approached by Fran Watson, who ran the Wrongful Conviction Clinic in Bloomington, Indianapolis, and she asked, what more could computers do? And in fact, computers could do a lot. And what we found is that we could compare evidence with evidence. So if there's an evidence genotype and another evidence item, they can be compared. People can't do that using older methods. We calculated exclusionary match statistics. We showed that these individuals had nothing to do with any of the evidence. We could reveal 5% minor mixtures. We could jointly analyze data. That's standard in statistics, but you can't do it by eye. And number five, we showed that three of the perpetrators were brothers, which was nothing that anybody had ever thought of and had nothing to do with the defendants. So in the end, we found five unidentified genotypes and the proof that the defendants were not linked to the crime. This was the subject of a recent 48 Hours segment, which talked about the exoneration of Daryl Pinkins. And about a year ago, uh, he was released from prison. In fact, I was preparing for the hearing a few days before. I was at the law school in Cyril Weck's class. I think he was elsewhere, so I got an opportunity to try out all of this evidence, which you can see in other talks on our website, on some poor law students. And after they graciously stayed and we went through what the hearing would look like, on the Uber ride home, I got a call from Fran Watson, who said, there's no hearing. The DA just dropped everything. There's no point, because the DNA is just exculpatory, and he would have no case to continue. So let me wrap up by asking, why is it that government DNA analysis fails? Why? There are many, many reasons. In fact, this is five of maybe 20 reasons, but this might be interesting for this audience. First is the crime lab culture. There's a difference between scientists and technicians. A match statistic 
is a quantitative statistical result that doctoral professors in genetics or chemistry or engineering are comfortable with and can explain. But people who are trained in biology tend to not be as comfortable with that sort of math and computing or explaining it. And the way to think of it is this. If you go and have an MRI scan developed, you expect that the technicians are going to develop wonderful data. The scans will be excellent. And then you will also expect that a very competent neuroradiologist is going to review that excellent data to determine which of a thousand diagnoses you may or may not have. But if that review is not done by a neuroradiologist but by a technician, you're only going to have the most obvious disease diagnosed and the rest will be inconclusive. That's kind of the schism that we have between biological technicians and the more mathematical scientists who don't yet exist as a community in forensics. There's also a courtroom culture. If you want to know one group that's more afraid of mathematics and computers than biology majors, it's probably attorneys. We gave a CLE in Ben's Ethics and Eats in December. I did it with Michael Mackin, former public defender in Allegheny County. And he began his talk by saying he surveyed 25 defense attorney colleagues and he asked them, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear there's DNA evidence against your client? And he said there were two main answers. You can imagine what they are. One was some explicative, right? I don't want to fill it in. You can fill it in yourself. And the other was, how quickly can I get a guilty plea? And what we went on to show in that CLE program was that isn't what needs to happen, particularly if there's inconclusive results or DNA mixtures. The DNA may even favor your client. It's just you're not going to know that from the crime lab. So there's a lot more that can be done with educating lawyers about how to aggressively cross-examine bad DNA evidence. There are more structural reasons that involve incentives. I'll just tell you about three. One is protecting the past. In my experience and the experience of other groups, the last thing that any jurisdiction wants to do is to recognize that they've had massive failure in thousands of DNA cases and reopen those cases. The civil liability could be enormous. Better to just move forward. And that fear we've seen quite palpably is a driving force in covering up the past. The sins are known, better to forget them. There's also the notion of preserving the present. The incentives that crime labs are under involve very tight federal control from the FBI, from NIST, regulatory bodies. The best way, easiest way to pass their audits and keep their funding and maintain access to the FBI's CODIS database is to just follow whatever the procedures are, regardless of their scientific basis. You're better off just doing what everybody else does. You'll pass your audits, you'll stay accredited, you'll keep your funding. And if you work in government, that self-preservation may outweigh the need to do the best science or justice. There's also the notion, last point, of funding the future. A great quote I saw on a professor's wall at Carnegie Mellon was in government, the problem is the solution. The more you can highlight the problem, the more money you're going to get. If you have a backlog, you're eligible for a DNA backlog grant. If you're so efficient that you don't have a backlog, you're going to lose out on a quarter of a million dollars every year. It makes no sense to not have a backlog. If you're going to report on difficult cases, you'll spend a huge amount of time and they may end up being less informative or inconclusive, you'll be cross-examined on them. That's painful as well. The government can magnify problems and ignore existing solutions. We had that actually in developing Trulio. The story of this is we were working with the British government in 1999, year 2000, on their databases. And then we were told about the mixture problem. So they had a whole committee of people, experts from England and Australia and New Zealand, all over the world, and they were going to get together and do this massive multi-million dollar solving the mixture problem. So when I came across for a meeting and I'd had working software that I developed, designed on the airplane and programmed in the hotel room, there was really no interest. 
think about it, you could have this great boondoggle, a research project for 10 years, and somebody's come along and solves it? That's awful. So that's what you see in government. Hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, so many stories about studies, projects, things that don't need to be done, technology that people would rather not talk about. If you can maintain this mixture problem that was solved 10 years ago, there's hundreds of millions of dollars available for various uh, agencies and labs. So my belief is the solution can never come from government. The incentives are wrong. We need a non-governmental organization, and that's why I, I and others recently founded Justice Through Science. Uh, its main tasks are to reanalyze all this forgotten DNA evidence and educate lawyers, scientists, and society. And this is how it will provide education and service. On the education front, lawyers need to understand how to litigate scientific evidence that may have problems. They have to know how to ask one question in 70 different forms. What is the scientific basis of your method? What is the scientific basis of your conclusion? And they can't stop at a surface level because when there is no scientific basis, that can come out in court. We need a new round of scientists who embrace math, teach it, are comfortable with it, make other people comfortable with it so they can educate juries about DNA. And we need journalists to understand the DNA basics so even something as simple as match statistics are reported properly. On the service side, student lawyers can help open up the past. If government does not want to reveal its past misdeeds, that's where lawyers can be helpful. Scientists can provide service by running technology like Trulial for free on any DNA that has ever happened or will happen in order to find the truth, and journalists need to understand the situation in order to tell these stories. And so that's what Justice Through Science will be doing. For more information, there are lectures and documents and courses on Cybernetics website, and if you have questions, please contact me. Thank you very much.